Thank you very much for an opportunity to meet the candidates and we appreciate the opportunity for them to speak to us and, and keep us informed. Uh, so uh, I hope you enjoy the evening, gain some benefit from it. Please note that uh, Northland Cable will be showing it the tape version next Tuesday and next Thursday respectively. We hope someday to be able to have it live and it's being streamed live tonight on Facebook. So uh, even those who are not physically present here tonight, uh, they are here spiritually or emotionally. The Chamber of Commerce and Leadership Rutherford have done a whole lot of thinking and working in the last couple months. And Pamela is chairman of the committee for Meet the Candidates and I'm gonna turn it over to Pamela. Good evening. Welcome on behalf of Leadership Rutherford. My name is Pamela Deck, and we're glad that you've come out on this rainy evening for Meet the Candidates tonight. We hope you'll find it very valuable. We also want to thank Isothermal Community College for hosting the forum. This is a very good space for us. And thank you to, as Clark said, all the people who worked so hard to put on this event. We've been working on this for several months. The Leadership Rutherford Board Alumni Committee, um, in which you'll see several of those people scattered around greeting you, and the Rutherford County Chamber Board of Directors. And if you're on the uh, Chamber Board or the Leadership Rutherford Board, if you would just raise your hand, please. Okay, thank you. Enjoy. Oh, you want to introduce the I was supposed to, I forgot. Our timekeeper and I, it's Greg Whitmire. He's the one with the cards that will be holding up to keep everybody in line. And our moderator this evening is Thad Harrell. We appreciate both of you gentlemen doing this tonight for us. Thad, you did great. Good evening. Welcome. How's everybody? Good? Good. I'm not singing tonight. I could do it. But tonight, tonight, tonight we're going to hear from our candidates. First off, let me say welcome to your beautiful. Community College, Isothermal Community College. We are delighted to have you all here, all the candidates, all the guests. Thank you for being on our campus. It's important for all of us in Rutherford County, our state and our nation, to be involved in this process. So we appreciate you taking the time to come out and listen and be involved. Uh, by way of housekeeping, men's restrooms are through that door over there. Women's restrooms are through that door. So make yourself at home while you're here tonight. Here's how this thing's going to roll out. Um, I'm going to call the candidates up, and we're going to give each one two minutes to make some opening remarks, okay? And they'll make those opening remarks right here at this podium. When, when I call you up, candidates, you can pick a side. That's up to you. You sit where you'd like to sit. But when you do your opening remarks, we want them to do them right here, okay? We'll, have, we'll let all the candidates do their opening remarks, and then I have a couple questions that I will ask each candidate, and we're going to let you stay at your table to answer those questions, and please, Slide those mics right in front of you. Uh, they won't work if you're not behind them. And then after I finish with those questions, we're going to have time for closing remarks, and you'll have up to two minutes for those closing remarks. Okay? So I think all the candidates have seen the questions. The committee uh, from the Chamber of Commerce and Leadership Rutherford have worked very diligently to work on questions. Those have been submitted out to the candidates, and those are the ones I'm going to ask. Okay? All right, so I'm, I'm so glad to be with you tonight. With that, let's begin. First, help me welcome to the stage the candidates for county commissioner. From District 1, running unopposed, Brian King. From District 4, running unopposed, Mike Benfield. And from District 5, Daryl Ray Sims and Alan Tony. If all four of you gentlemen would come on up, let's give them a hand. Uh, before the... We, we started this evening, spoke with Mr. King and Mr. Benfield. Since they are running unopposed, they have chosen just to make their opening comments, and then they're going to join you back in the audience. So let's start with Mr. King. You have two minutes for opening comments. Come on. Welcome, everybody. And uh, the first thing I'd like to do is thank everyone for their support. It has been an extreme honor to serve as your county commissioner. But tonight I was thinking about, you know, the questions, and I'm, I'm running a post, and I figured it might be three against one if we dove into the questions. So during my two minutes, I'll kind of like give a little, little, little history about or what we do as, as a board. You know, I'll call it um, three things. Homework. 
people say, well, how does, how does this county commission work? What do we do different than we haven't done before? What well, many people don't realize, and, and I want you to know tonight, is that we do our homework before our meetings. At least one week before our meetings, we have a packet that's delivered to us. It's by electronically with everything that's on the agenda. So we get a chance to study what's coming before us. After that, we meet one-on-one -on -one or two-on-one -on -one with our county manager, our finance director, our county attorney, anyone else based on what's on the agenda. This gives us an opportunity one-on-one -on -one, to ask questions about what we may have in our mind what's happening. And then, let me back up a little bit. The um, reason we do one-on-one -on -one or two-on-one -on -one, because if we have three in a room, it, it qualifies as a quorum and that's against state law. So we're very careful not to have a quorum outside of the public view. We meet with our county manager and our team prior to our meeting, just like I said, and then we have our meeting. I've been fortunate to serve as the chairman of the Board of County Commissioners this year and the previous year. And I don't know when I go into a meeting which way it is going to go. We don't poll each other. We don't ask each other questions. We really don't know until we get into there and the questions asked, how are you going to vote on a subject? There are questions that are asked. You can hear that in our meetings. But the homework has already been done. Ours have been done before that. So this is something that this board has done since day one of my term. And it's something we do just so that when we're ready to do business, we're ready to do business. The second thing I wanted to talk about is economic development. I've been working on the board for almost four years now. Economic development is something that's very dear to our community and to this board. But it doesn't happen without, time's up. <laughs> Y'all enjoy, and if you have any questions regarding how the board works, come see me. Thank you, Mr. King. Mr. Benfield, you'll have two minutes. By the way, this is uh, Mr. Greg Whitmire right here in the front. He'll be uh, telling you all when time is up. So thank you, Mr. Whitmire. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Michael Benfield. Uh, like uh, Mr. King, I am running unopposed. Uh, this is my second term, and I just appreciate you as county residents for supporting us and having the faith and believing in what we do. Uh, I have been a public servant since 1976. I started with EMS uh, and I'm still a paramedic, but uh, I, I worked in Catawba County. I came from Hickory uh, with the Highway Patrol and I retired from the Highway Patrol here in, in Rutherford County. This has been an honor for the last 42 years to serve in public service. Uh, I will uh, give you another four years of solid uh, constant work like Mr. King said, we constantly are getting emails, uh, updates, and follow through with what we do. I've never had so many emails sometimes, but we always try to stay ahead of the ball and we try to involve the community in what we do. Mr. Uh, Tony and myself had the pleasure and the honor to get invited to the White House this year. Uh, Mr. Trump's administration uh, actually brought us in to work on the infrastructure starting in North Carolina. We were the third state to get invited. This is the first time it's ever been done in the history of the United States. So it is an honor to serve you as a commissioner, and I thank you for the opportunity uh, to give you another term. Thank you very much. Mr. Sims, you have two minutes for your opening remarks. Well, I'd like to start by just thanking everybody for coming out tonight, thanking uh, Isothermal for putting this on, the Chamber, the Leadership Rutherford. Uh, it's a great honor to be able to stand in front of you tonight and for you to take time out of your schedule to come out and hear what we have to say tonight. Uh, and that's great. It's nice to see civic uh, duty and civic responsibility uh, to be educated uh, before you vote, and that's a, that's a great thing. I appreciate you dude coming out tonight. Uh, my name is Darrell Sims. I'm a business owner in Rutherford County. Uh, been here since 1987. Most of uh, everybody I meet says, are you kin to this Sims or that Sims? I'm kin to them all. So uh, <laughs> some way or another, we're kin to all of them. But uh, everybody asks that question. I'm married to my wife, Tina. Been married for 25 years. Got two kids, uh, 16 and 19. Uh, came through Rutherford County Schools. Uh, son just graduated. My daughter will graduate uh, next year. So uh, we're right here in town. We're local people, obviously. Uh, and we just want to you know, get involved and, and try to help the county as best we can and offer our service to you. I thank you for listening to us tonight. Mr. Tony, you have two minutes. I'll take the opportunity to thank the college for allowing us to use the space and also 
Mr. Harrell and the, the Chamber of Commerce and Realized Rutherford, or uh, not Realized Rutherford, but Leadership Rutherford, excuse me. I just want to thank everybody and uh, just let you know a little bit about me. Name's Alan Tony. I've born and raised here, been here all my life. Uh, spent most of my time in Sunshine. That's where I currently live now. Been married to my wife, Kathy, for 24 years. We have uh, two boys, or I guess they're men, because they're 19 and 24, so they're, they're men now. But uh, my oldest one is uh, currently at Appalachian. He's working on his master's in planning. And my youngest one is a sophomore at Gardner-Webb who is majoring in uh, computer science. So they, and they came through the uh, public school system here in the county. Again, we've been here all of our lives, so they, they, they come through and I'm, I'm proud of the accomplishments they've made and continuing on with their education. Uh, I own a uh, small business in the county, it's called uh, Service Master Unlimited. We do uh, fire and water restoration and carpet and upholstery cleaning. And we've been doing that since 1998. So I can relate to a lot of people how things are as far as to be able to uh, get, get through life having to uh, make a living and we work hard to do that. And uh, been a commissioner for almost four years. I'm currently the uh, vice chairman of our commission board and I enjoy serving the people of Rutherford County. I, I think it's an honor, it's a privilege to be able to do that and, and to make decisions. You know, some of those decisions, I know Brian alluded to some of them, we do our homework. But, you know, some of those decisions are hard decisions and and really struggle through some of them, but most of them are decisions that are, are for the people of this county, and I'm glad I'm able to make those decisions. And you trusted me four years ago to make those decisions for you, and I'm asking you again to trust me for another four years to do those decisions that work for everybody in Rutherford County, not just certain individuals. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, I have a couple questions for you both. Mr. Sims, we're going to start with you. If you'll slide that mic right over in front of you. So here's your question, Mr. Sims. Considering the recent economic growth in Rutherford County, what role do you believe the county commission should play in furthering our long-term economic growth and vitality, and what steps will you take to ensure that our county does not regress in economic development? Well, I think one of the things that we have to do, uh, and we must do is we've got to continue to recruit companies uh, to come to this county. Uh, we do have a good economic upturn uh, going right now. We don't know how long it'll last, but we do know that it's happening now. And one of the things we have to do is continue to recruit. Uh, I think we have a good board uh, doing that. The EDC is doing a good job of recruiting companies and trying to bring them to the county. Uh, another thing I think we really need to do is while things are good, uh, start to invest in some infrastructure in the county. I think the, uh, one of the things that I hear a lot is, is water. People would like to see more water service uh, out in the rural areas. We have water in the towns, but you know, once you get outside of the town, the rural areas, they struggle a lot of times to get water, and, uh, and that's a big thing. I think the other thing I see is high-speed internet. I, I do home inspections. One of the things that I do is home inspections for people coming to our county. And they move here, and one of the first questions they ask me is, what do you have for high-speed internet? And a lot of times we have to say, not a lot to choose from. And, uh, and sometimes nothing at all to choose from. So I think we, as a board, we're gonna have to move towards pushing those things. I know that the county doesn't build high-speed internet lines, I realize that. But as a board, they can move and, and try to push those things and recruit companies that actually do that type work and see if we can grow the county that way. The only way we're gonna get higher paying jobs, there's tons of jobs out there right now. Problem with a lot of jobs is they're seven, eight, nine dollars an hour job, and most of you and most of us can't live on that. So we have to recruit jobs here that are above average paying jobs, and I think that's part of the way we can do that. All right, thank you, Mr. Sims. I should have said when we started, we're gonna give each candidate up to three minutes, and uh, Mr. Whitmire will keep us on track there. Uh, Mr. Tony, same question. I'm happy to repeat it if you'd like. No, I have it, I have right. it wrote down okay. or typed out. Uh, we need to continue to support our uh, workforce and skill development in the county. We also need to uh, ensure that our citizens have the skills, tools, and work ethic to compete in the 21st century uh, job market. And uh, one example of a way to do that is the new ICC Applied Science 
and workforce development facility, and that'll be critical to achieving these uh, skills. Uh, the, the center was something, or the workforce development applied sciences is one of the things that I know we as Brian and, and Mike, that's one of the things we run on was being able to get that built. And with the help of uh, the EDA and also some uh, other grant funds, we were able to, to do that. And actually that building will be complete this month. So it'll be a great incubation spot for businesses that seek to relocate here and wanna, wanna do business here. We'll be able to train their employees and, and help them to be able to, to further along, you know, having the skills that the people here need. And, and also, we need to continue to work with our Economic Development Commission. Uh, it moved into a private-public partnership between the county and private industry or private individuals we need to continue to support that. Uh, we're looking for, uh, one of the issues that we're running into now is, is running out of available spaces. So we need, to, we need to help support that so we can have those spaces between 50 and 100,000 square feet with 30 foot ceilings. That's modern manufacturing and we need to work on, on furthering that along. And we also need to continue to address the substance addiction issues in the county and close the gaps to, for access to mental, mental and behavioral health services in Rutherford County. Our citizens deserve better and, and, and we need to improve our access to direct services without having to drive out of Rutherford County. You know, right, right now the folks that have access to this, they have to leave the county to be able to get it. And we need it here locally or local and that was one of the reasons for our, for our changing from uh, via to partners and our, our, our MCO LME, which is our mental health and behavioral health organization. So that's why we, were, we, were, we voted to change. So we're, hope, we're, we're optimistic that it'll be a great change. And uh, the, the other commissioners in the counties that Partners is in have, have uh, great accolades for them. They say they're a wonderful company and they're, and they're really happy with them. So, that was one of the reasons I made that decision to change that, and that's going to help with our workforce development because drugs is a problem. Thank you, Mr. Tony. I'm going to ask you the next question first, okay? Our county is filled with natural beauty, which attracts business and tourism. How do we maintain growth for business and industry while protecting our natural resources? Mr. Tony. Well, well you know, you, you ask that question and, you know, the, the citizens of Rutherford County have made it quite clear that they don't want any zoning. I think we're all well aware of that. So one of the ways that we can keep our natural beauty and also our economic development and our tourism is, uh, one thing is topography. You know, our county, manufacturing businesses are not going to move into the areas that are, that are conducive to our tourism industry. And also, we can do things with our infrastructure. You know, he brought up some infrastructure issues, but if we strategically place our infrastructure in areas that are, that are friendly to the manufacturing or even retail and commercial development, then that'll help them to, to go to those places instead of looking at the other places that's good for tourism. And also, we can look at something with our uh, agritourist tourism and uh, agriculture. That's also another way to help help our county, you know, those farms that are out there that people want to come and see, you know, there, there's a lot, of, a lot of individuals out there that would like to see that, and we need to bolster that also to help with our natural beauty. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tony. Mr. Sims, same question. How do we maintain growth for business and industry while protecting our natural resources? Well, that's always going to be a challenge. Uh, Rutherford County, just about all of the county, is tourism friendly. I mean, it's a beautiful place. People come here, people move here for a myriad of reasons. Uh, so that's always going to be tricky. I think Mr. Tony is right. I mean, you have to strategically place your infrastructure so that uh, you can guide where they may want to settle a business uh, in one area or the other away from those tourist areas. Uh, I think that is very important. I think another thing that we can do is uh, work together with our uh, partners, all the towns. I'd like to see the county commission board work really a lot more closely with the towns, all the town leadership boards, so that we can form some type of a strategic plan so that we have something to offer to these businesses that come to town. 
uh, or that are looking at our county. When we, when a business looks at Rutherford County, they're looking at Rutherford County, and they're probably looking at three to five other locations. And uh, so when you're looking at Rutherford County versus Cleveland or Polk or uh, Mecklenburg or wherever they're looking at, uh, we have to be able to have something, you know, somewhat competitive to offer them as far as location. Uh, like Mr. Tony said, uh, we have to be able to, to show them some places that are ready to build on, if not already uh, built, like he was talking about with the 30 foot ceilings and things like that. Uh, but we have to also nurture our, probably one of our biggest businesses here, which is tourism. Uh, we, we're gonna have to nurture that and, and look at that more closely and say, hey, this is what we are now. This is our number, it used to be cotton mills, cotton mills are gone. And, and now it's tourism. Tourism is one of the huge uh, businesses. It's here, we have it, and, and let's use it. And so I think we really have to push that uh, to the public, push that outside, and, and build those jobs and, and cultivate that, that avenue as well. Thank you, sir. We're gonna give each of you uh, two minutes now to come up to the podium. Uh, Mr. Sims, we'll start with you. And uh, this will be your closing remarks. Come on up. <coughs> Well, I'd like to thank you one more time uh, for allowing us to be here tonight, for taking just a few minutes out of your busy schedule uh, to come out and listen to us. Uh, we're both, we're both, and all these men before you uh, are all doing this because we care about the county. We're not, we're not out here looking for uh, accolades, and we're sure not out here, Mr. Tony and us commissioners, sure not out here looking for a paycheck. Uh, that's just not what this is about. It's about community service. We're here to serve the community. One of the things that I want to do is bring the community and the commission board together. I want to have that communication where you as a citizen, anytime, anywhere, can feel like, hey, this I want to talk to the commission board about. This I want to bring to their attention. And I want to be open about that. I think we need to have some, some town hall type meetings. I think we need to get out and, and get where you're at so that you have that access and really be able to talk to us and feel free about uh, talking about that. I'd like to see transparency in some of the decision making. Uh, Mr. Uh, King mentioned that and I, and I like that. I, I want to see that transparency. I want you to know why we chose to do this or that if I'm elected. So uh, that, that's what we have to be. Transparency in government is, is lacking greatly. Uh, I think we can all agree on that now. Uh, so that's one of the things that I really want to see us uh, work on if I can get elected. And uh, lastly, I'd just like to ask you to consider us. Uh, please consider us when you go vote. And uh, we appreciate you one more time. We appreciate your time this evening. Mr. Tony, you have two minutes. Well, thank everybody for, for coming out, and thank you for your support, and thank you for your understanding. You know, as, as I stand up here in front of you, I think of the, of the things that this board that I sit on has accomplished. We have a, a wonderful working relationship with the, the other four commissioners that I sit with. If we vote against each other during the meeting, we're the same before the meeting as we were after the meeting. I do believe this board puts the, the people of this county first. And he, he hit on transparency a little bit, and I think this is probably one of the more transparent boards. We, we post our agenda online. We, uh, we, we try to be open about the, the decisions we make. We have presenters to come up and, and talk about what they are presenting to us to do these different resolutions or, or just the general business of the county. And, and, I'm, and I'm thankful that we are working toward that. We developed a new uh, website to help to be more user friendly so that you can access the information easier. No, it doesn't have everything on there, but I think it helps with our, with our information. You know, in, in, our, in our jobs and economic growth, you know, right now in this county, we have an extreme diversity of employers. You know, I know we, we, we still have textiles here. We have plastics here. We have uh, valve manufacturing here. You, you know, and the, and the list goes on. We have a, a, a great diversity. We have a, a place called Cardinal Tissue. You, you know, so we have people doing paper products here. And, and these pays, you know, the salaries of these folks that they make, they have to be above the median income to, for us to be able to give them economic incentives. And we do give them economic incentives to get them here. 
because they are looking at other places. You know, they're not just looking at us. But you know, right now, our, our economic development director had told us we've had 45 inquiries this year on people wanting to look at being in our county. So, so there's a lot of folks out there wanting to move here and wanting to be here. Thank you. How about one more round of applause for all our candidates for county commission? Thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, next, please help me welcome to the stage the candidates for North Carolina House of Representatives, District 112, Mr. Gregory James Gallagher and Mr. David Rogers. Let's give them a hand. As with uh, candidates for county commissioner, we're going to have uh, two minutes for opening comments, and then we'll have a couple questions that I will ask, uh, and they'll have three minutes apiece on those questions, and then closing comments. First up, I would like to ask Mr. Gallagher to come up, and uh, you have two minutes, sir, for your opening comments. Good evening. Thank you for welcoming me to uh, this organization to talk to you tonight. My name is Gregory James Gallagher. I'm a high school teacher down at Chase High School. I teach history. I've been at the high school for five years. I'm not, by my accent, you can actually tell that I'm probably not originally from Rutherford County. I'm actually from Illinois. But I've spent, my family moved here in Asheville in 1979. I worked for a gentleman by the name of Jamie Clark, who was a congressman for the 11th District. I worked for him on and off for about four years. I also worked for the U.S. House of Representatives for about a year and a half. And then eventually I came back to North Carolina and I worked on my family business for about 19 years. And then, like a lot of people during the recession of 2008, 2009, my business went some, had to be sold. I had to figure out a new way of life, so I got into education. Eventually I got a phone call from a gentleman by the name of Kevin Bradley down at Chase High School. With some people, I'm sure the Bradley family and the Francis family wonder if that was the wisest call to make at times because I'm now running for office. And the main reason I'm running for office is because I've seen the plight of teachers in North Carolina up close and personal. One of the things that happened was I had sort of my Hamlet moments about actually getting involved in this campaign. I kept side vacillating because I didn't want to really, wasn't sure I wanted to do it. But eventually I saw the Parkland Massacre back on February 14th, and I realized at that time that maybe it was my time to get involved in politics again. So, talking with some teachers, I decided to register, to, to register as a candidate, and I decided to get involved. Since then, my students have been helpful in the campaign. I've learned a lot about, about education, learned a lot about the issues that are affecting us. But I've also learned one thing about being in politics. And I'm, this is a comment to my, to my opponent here. One of the lessons I've learned, and Mr. Clark taught, taught me, is always take the high road, not the low road. And tonight, I plan to keep it that way. Thank you. Mr. Rogers, you have two minutes. Hi, my name is David Rogers. I'm your state representative. I have been for a little over two years. And first off, I'd like to say that I feel very fortunate. One of the greatest honors of my life has been to represent you. And, but the, the thing I wanted to point out is I've been fortunate in, in my, my opponents. Uh, two years it was Ben Edwards, and the campaign was so gentlemanly. We, we, other than the issues that where we differed, we spoke nothing but kindly about each other. And it was just a cordial, gentlemanly race. And Mr. Gallagher's been the same way. It's, it's been, it's been uh, nothing, nothing but what it should be. And we see nationwide, all the divisiveness and, and contentiousness and, and just horrible campaigns, but it's not been that way here locally either two years ago or two years ago or this time, and it's been great. Um, and, and I see that in the county commissioners, and I hope to see it in all the other races too. It's just everybody's been cordial. Um, I'm from Rutherford County. I've lived my wife here, Misty. Um, between us, we have 86 years living in Rutherford County. She was born here. I wasn't born here, but I've lived here since I was six. So I counted it up today, and we have 86 years of living here. Um, I went to Rutherford Elementary and then New Hope. Most, many of you probably remember New Hope. It's not really a school anymore. And then R.S. Central, and she was at Ruth Mount Vernon and then R.S. Central. Um, and I'm the, I'm the Republican candidate. It's been an honor to be down there. I'm, I'm a conservative candidate. Um, 
I haven't, you know, this is our only forum this year, so I really, we haven't really staked each other out as far as issues go, but um, I'm endorsed by the NRA, have an A rating from the NRA, um, I'm pro-life. Um, the NRA, the gun issues, they've come up once in the past couple of years. We had a constitutional carry um, bill that came up and I supported it. Um, no pro-life issues have come up in the past couple of years. I know that half of the Democrats supported the bill that would have basically legalized all abortion, up to even partial birth abortion. The Democrats, about half of them, signed off as co-sponsors of this bill to basically make abortion carte blanche available to anybody that wants it. And of course it never went anywhere because we have a Republican House and a Republican Senate. It went to the Rules Committee and just died there. Um, and, and I think that was appropriate. Um, I don't know his position on that, but that is my position on that. Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Rogers, we're going to start with you on the first question. Speak to the direction our education system is headed in terms of funding and the impact this has on public schools, including charter schools, community colleges, teachers and instructors, and private schools. Well, I can say this, that education has been, falling, has been behind as far as funding goes years ago, but we've been increasing the spending on education every, every biennium. The budget's done every two years. In every biennium, we've done what we could to increase that spending, especially in the past couple of years. In the past six years, and I, these numbers, so I have to write them down here to, to keep up with the numbers, but in the past six years, we've increased education spending by $2 billion, and we still have more to go. Uh, teachers are still, and I know statistics can go any way you want them to, but the statistics that I understand are about the average teacher pays about 50000 and I can tell you that that's true because my daughter is a teacher, and she starts out, this is her first year teaching, and her salary this year is $50,000. Um, so I know that that's true, but I know that all teachers aren't getting that. Some are starting out way less than that. So we have a, a long ways to go. I was, and I'm sure that Mr. Gallagher is better at these education numbers than I am, but it seems to me that the average salary for teachers is still quite a bit higher than 50000 so we've got, still got work to do on that. And um, one of the things, there's a couple more things, if I have time, I want to mention real quickly that I'm looking forward to working with in the legislature is we have a, a committee that we've... Uh, established in the 2017 Appropriations Bill is called a um, Finance Reform, it's a joint committee, and, and what that committee does is it's going to reevaluate all the ways that we allocate money towards the uh, individual school districts. What we have right now is about 34 different buckets that the, the school boards have that they have to spend from, and if they don't spend it, they have to give it back to the state. Um, but what this does is just study all of the ways that we allocate money to the different boards and um, look at other, other states, how they do it, and look at the best way to do that. And they're due to have a report back to us, hopefully by this next long session, so that we can make adjustments there as necessary. And one of the other things that I, I, I'm excited about is, Rowan Salisbury is a school district that was one of the poorest, I think was the poorest performing in the state. And what we have is what we called a renewal district. And what that is, is instead of uh, Rowan Salisbury district getting all of their money in 34 different buckets that they have to spend in certain areas and the state dictates exactly how they spend it, Basically, they're going to get a lump sum. Um, they, they could have done it this year. They were authorized to do it this year, but they're going to study it for the next year and start it doing it next year. But they're going to get it basically a lump sum, and almost like a charter school, but they're going to spend it how they want. And um, hopefully they can go from bottom to, to you know, a, a great school system. And I, I'm looking forward to that, and it's a pilot program. So I'm hoping that we can expand that in the future. And basically what that does is give local control uh, of your education spending to the local counties. And that's what I think is a wonderful thing. And I'm, I know I'm running out of time here, but I'd also like to say that I'm very much pro-school choice. Um, I have one daughter at Thomas Jefferson Charter School, which is wonderful, but it didn't seem quite right for my son. So he's at Rutherford Elementary. So, but that, that's the beauty of it. There's a choice there. And, um, and my two children went two different directions with the schools they go to, and it's working out great for both of them. So thank you. Thanks, Mr. Gallagher, the same question. Um, speak to the direction our educa education system is headed in terms of funding and the impact this has on all our schools and teachers. Uh, the funding is, has to be improved significantly. Right now, the top teachers who have been 25 years in are maxed out at $52,500. This has been going on for several years. We have a situation at Chase High School where three of, the, three of the top teachers in our school are thinking about retiring. Once we lose those teachers who are in their early 50s, we lose a lot of experience and it goes out the door. A lot of the adjustments he's discussing with you are for people at my level, eight years in the, in the middle. 
we have to look at these teachers who have put in all, have all this experience, have worked really hard for us. We can't lose them. Last year, the, my next door neighbor, who was the health and science teacher, decided to retire and decided to move to South Carolina where she's working at Conway High School. She left. I have several people who I know personally are planning now to go to South Carolina after they retire and continue teaching. Why are we losing these people? Also, the question, the thing you have to look at is I started looking at other states. Now being originally from the Midwest, one of the states I looked at was Iowa. Iowa was the number six education system in the country. Iowa has a third of the population of North Carolina. Iowa has a third of the gross domestic product of North Carolina. Iowa starting teachers start at $42,000 a year. We start at $37,000. Iowa pays the top teachers $68,000 a year with STEPS, which is, which is just termed, I think, by the school boards, and also longevity pay. Our top teachers are paid with a BA, $52,000, 500, and they're cut off at that point, and they get frustrated. Now, if you want, you have a B-rated school, Chase High School, and you have an A-rated school for, the, for our charter schools. You have some great schools around here. Why is that? It's your teachers. It's the top veteran teachers who have been giving you everything they got. And now, and they're, they're maxed out, they see no future here, they're planning on leaving. I'm a, still considered a younger teacher. I've been in it seven years. I still have a lot to learn from them. Some of the finest individuals I've ever met in my life work at Chase High School. And at some point, they're gonna decide that they, they're tired, they need to make more money, retirement's in the picture, and they need to go somewhere else. You do not wanna lose these people. Start looking at a new way of doing the budget. Start looking at new revenue streams. I'm not talking about taxes. I'm talking about things like the lottery, figure out Lottery, only 30% of that lottery goes to education. The rest of it goes to administrative things for the lottery. It's, it's not helping us enough. So there's lots of things we need to change. I would work with the Republicans to change them, but we have got to look at a new way of doing our revenue. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Gallagher, I'm gonna ask this next, next question of you. Rutherford County is one of only a few counties in North Carolina without major interstate access, which is often a deterrent to landing good manufacturing, manufacturing or industrial businesses. One possible solution is to have Highway 74 designated as an interstate highway. One, do you support that initiative? And then what other initiatives do you support to help Rutherford County overcome these obstacles created by not having the necessary roads in place to attract business? Uh, first place, I would definitely support it being an interstate. I'm sure there are some issues that will be discussed about how we do that. I, um, to give you a story about what I have to do in the summer, during the summer I have to go up and work at J. Crew up in Asheville. And it is as hard a job as you can imagine. I, I work from 3 to 12 o'clock at night. And I have to come home and I have to pull myself out of bed and trying to campaign against David under those conditions. It was really difficult. If I could wake up Saturday morning at 10 o'clock, it was great. But what I learned when I go up to Asheville, is these people want, these companies are not happy in Asheville. The property tax is too high, the cost of living is too high. So if you were to expand your road system like 74 and expand it, and make it an interstate and have 221 and maybe develop some more industrial parks down there. You're gonna start getting businesses from places like Asheville and other places. You have a great school system, you have a great way of life. I'm very happy here. Trust me, I was happy to get out of the Asheville, Buncombe County area. I was thrilled to get out of there. Um, but there's a lot of things down here that people want. School systems, you expand the roads, you expand industrial parks, you must diversify your economy you must revitalize your downtowns. Do not become like Asheville and places like Hendersonville become, which have become gentrified. I mean, if you want, go up and meet a bunch of snotty people, go downtown Asheville on a Saturday night and you will meet them. They're the total opposite of the people I meet down here in Forest City. Also, one of the things you have to realize is that if you have an industrial park in place, those businesses can come in right away. They don't have to go through rules and regulations to get in. Also, you want to look at 64, expanding it. If you're talking about improving your tourism, 
One of the big problems I have is I get on 64, and David probably knows this because he probably has to go up to Burke County occasionally. Nothing like getting on 64 and getting behind a horse trailer and drive, take what is usually an hour drive, now it takes you an hour and a half. So expanding the road systems would help tourism. They expand. You want to diversify your economy. You want to improve. Another thing you might, might want to do as far as creating jobs is get more vocational classes in schools. Um, we, only have, we only have wood shop at our school, auto shops over in East Rutherford and RS, so why don't we expand all the uh, vocational possibilities for our students, because not all of them are going to college. And let's also look at the possibility of teaching about the 21st, 21st century economy, which will be so focused, sadly, on learning about robotics. I'm not sure if isothermal does that, but it's something they need to look at. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. <laughs> Mr. Rogers, same question. We don't have an interstate designation here uh, in our county. Uh, other road issues, what would you say about those issues? Well, as far as the interstate designation, that's actually already in the works. The, Fed, the federal government and the state government is already working on that and it's what we're, what we're planning on is a corridor between I-26 and the Port of Wilmington and we're working on a bypass around Monroe and around Shelby and Shelby the ones you can already you can go down there and see it's already blacktop now so it's we've made a lot of progress towards that and as far as improving the roads that's obviously a need that we have here in in every county but especially in rural counties such as this and what we did this last this I think it was this spring that we did this it was the NC build bond it's um it's, a, it's actually not a bond, it's an indebtedness, but it's a $3 billion indebtedness over the next 10 years. And we're able to pull out $300 million a year for that. And what that does is it allows us to not move projects back down the road years from now. The projects that want, right now we had, or before we did this, we only had 17% of the funds available for the building projects that we had. But what this NC Build um, revenue does, or it allows us to have access to up to $300 million a year. So such as 221 and 64, he's right. Um, money's not going to keep those things from being done um, because that money is available um, and, it, and it ends up being a whole lot cheaper to do it this way to have this money available up front than trying to do it in each legislative session over the next 10 years so that money's available and you're going to see projects such as 221 and anything that he's doing on 64 they're going to be accelerated none of them are going to be put on the back burner because of money so that's something that we've already addressed the money is, is available and so that's something you're going if to you, if you drive between here and Raleigh as much as I do Boy, there's construction everywhere, and, and the transportation chair, um, John Torb, he's so proud of himself. Everywhere he goes, he says, have y'all seen too many orange cones? We're working on the roads left and right. And he's right. I mean, they're everywhere between here and Raleigh. But um, that's something that's not going to be slowed down at all because of money. The money's going to be there, and something we're going to get done. So. Thank you, sir. Mr. Rogers, uh, we're going to have you come up to the podium now, and you have two minutes for your closing remarks. Well, I won't need but a few seconds. I'll tell you, I'm, I'm the conservative candidate. It's a, it's a difference in ideology, I suppose, between the Republicans and the Democrats. I'm on the Republican team in Raleigh. Don't agree with everything we do down there, but for the most part, I'm on, I'm, a, I'm on board with everything the Republicans do down there for the, for the most part. And if there's things we differ on, our, our caucus has a rule, and this is the, the complete truth. We are in our caucus, and the Speaker of the House, Tim Moore, uh, the Majority Leader, John Bell, he'll tell us. He'll say, first, you vote your conscience, and then you vote your community, and then you vote your caucus. The caucus is third. First is your conscience, and then it's your community, your, your constituents, and then it's your caucus. So you do what you feel is right, and we've had several of us, uh, I guess you could call them renegades. John Bless is, is one. He's the, <laughs> the most... He disagrees with the rest of the caucus so much, but he's not, he's not putting a, you know, down for it. He's not looked down upon for it. We're free to vote our conscience. And um, my conscience is a very conservative conscience, and I think it pretty much reflects this community. So thank you very much. Mr. Gallagher, you have two minutes. Uh, thank you again for inviting me here tonight. Um, one of the issues I always get asked is why did you get an education at a later, later time in your life? And one of the reasons I did is because I'd always made a promise to my father and to my family that I'd, I had thought about education, but when you look at the money, I decided probably not. But my wife had been pregnant, and we lost our child. And at that point, you know, our marriage disintegrated, and at the point I had to reinvent my life. And I decided at that point, my dedication in life would be to that lost child. 
And that's why I got an education. And when I see the kids I work with at Chase High School, and I see them growing up, I see what possibly can be my daughter or son. And my goal in life is to make their lives better. The only legacy I have left now in this world is to make it a better world. And that's my goal. As for anything else, you know, I'm proud to be running against this man. I met, I've seen him around, and he's been very affable tonight, as I've always heard he has been. It's been a great pleasure to be here talking to you tonight. And hopefully in November, it's November 6th, November 6th, <laughs> November 6th, you will vote for me, but at least get out and vote. And I thank you, and have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Let's give them a hand as they come off the stage. On your program, you will see that we were expecting to have folks uh, from uh, the, the candidates for Soil and Water Conservation District Supervisor. They had a conflict. They could not be with us tonight. So we're going to skip over now to uh, the sheriff race. Uh, help me now welcome to the stage candidates for sheriff, Mr. Chris Francis, Mr. Jason Ray Weiss, and Mr. Freddie Uten. I'll give them a hand. Mr. Uten, we're going to start with you. If you'll come on up, uh, you have two minutes to make some opening comments. I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight. Uh, I'll start off tell you a little bit about myself. I live in the Boston community. Been there most of my life. Um, I'm married to Lacey. I've been with Lacey uh, 20 years. Been married 15. We have one son. I have a 13-year-old named Ethan. In our spare time, we spend a lot of time with our son. Uh, chase him around football, archery, wrestling. Uh, we're avid outdoorsmen, the whole family. Uh, started my law enforcement career in 2002 at Spindale. Spent two years there. While there, I had an opportunity to start working narcotics early on. Um, applied for a job at the sheriff's office in 2004. And I was lucky enough to get it. Spent most of my career there from 2004 to 2014 as a narcotics investigator. Uh, the last eight months I was there, I was on the road patrol. And that has really opened up my eyes. You know, when, when I was dealing with narcotics, you think about it. We look rough. We deal with the worst of the worst. So I got to, right at the end, I got to go back out to the road and really, really see the community again, you know, where I'd started at. Um, I'll, I'll speed it on up for some more things we'll get in. Also, I'm a deputy at Polk County. I've been a deputy there since 2009. Uh, I'm sworn there as a... Uh, I have assigned to the narcotics, the road, I do everything like a special deputy. I've also sworn with Homeland Security as a federal task force officer. Uh, I'm an instructor. Uh, I was a past specialized instructor with hazmat and explosives, clan lab certified, um, on and on accolades. Uh, I, I don't remember them. Uh, certificates do not make a good officer. People who care about the community do. I appreciate y'all once again for coming out and I look forward to hearing any questions anyone has. And I just want to make sure Mr. Weiss is not with us tonight. Okay. Mr. Francis, you have two minutes for opening comments. Thank you. I'd like to introduce myself to you. My name is Chris Francis. I am from Rutherford County. I'm 44 years old. I've been married to my wife, Jill, for 22 years this December. We have two sons, Coleman and Caden. Coleman's a freshman at NC State University, and Caden is a sophomore at Chase High School where he is heavily involved in FFA. As a matter of fact, one of our left come over here in the rain. He was putting up fence posts because he's hoping to get some calves pretty soon, so he's dedicated. <clears throat> My family attends Pleasant Hill Baptist Church. I have served as a deacon there, as well as a Sunday school teacher uh, and on the youth council. We um, have been going there for, for over 20 years. When you talk about my experience, I have over 22 years of law enforcement experience. I started uh, law enforcement between my junior and senior year at Appalachian State University as a reserve deputy. And after I graduated Appalachian State with a Bachelor of Science in Criminal Justice, previous to coming here to ICC, I went to Hickory Police Department. I knew then, uh, 22 years ago, a little over 22 years ago, I wanted to get back home. And I had that opportunity to come to Forest City Police Department. 
and, and later to the sheriff's office. I've been a road officer. I've been a field training officer. I've been uh, a first line supervisor. I've been a criminal investigator. I've been a supervisor. I've been sheriff for the last eight years. I've also taught basic law enforcement training here to college since 2000, teaching most of the law enforcement officers and instructing them here in this county. Thank you for your opportunity, this opportunity to meet you tonight. Gentlemen, I have uh, some questions for you all. We'll start with um, Mr. Francis. Mr. Francis, what challenges facing law enforcement will you address as sheriff as our county continues to change and grow? When I became sheriff in 2010, we were right in the middle of a serious recession. And I've not been able to obtain a lot of extra resources at the sheriff's office, and I understand that. Uh, I hear the county manager uh, speak, and I've worked for, uh, with three county managers now, about uh, there's, there's lack of funds, there's lack of funds, there's lack of funds, and I certainly understand that. Even as we climb out of this recession, that means we're still climbing out of a recession. There's still lack of funds. So I've been able to um, rearrange uh, the sheriff's office and restructure the sheriff's office to get more deputy sheriffs to be able to re respond to calls. I've changed assignments, I've changed uh, the schedules to where there's more deputy sheriffs that work on weekends and there's more deputy sheriffs that work during peak hours with only getting uh, two new deputy sheriffs in the last eight years. Uh, having been a road officer, having been an investigator, having been in their shoes, I understand those needs. And I, uh, also knowing there's no money, have, have done everything I possibly can do to take burden off of those deputy sheriffs. However, we have 566 square miles um, here in Rutherford County. That's a lot to patrol. So even as we have lowered the uh, uniform crime rate tremendously, uh, it doesn't change the fact that there's still that many square miles and only so many deputies to answer the calls. So I will continue to work with our uh, county manager. I'll continue to work with our commissioners as I see any uh, increase in crime, as I see any increase in population. Uh, we've been steady uh, around 68,000 for, for most of the last eight years. We've declined, we're back uh, on the incline now. I will continue uh, to, to evaluate those calls for service as well and work with our county manager. Uh, I, I'm not going to stop finding new ways to make more out of less. I will continue to do that. But uh, at some point, I may have to, have to, to, to nudge and say we do need those resources because it's my responsibility and I don't take that lightly. Uh, the other concern that I have as we grow and we change is our uh, jail. We have a jail uh, that houses 203 uh, inmates. When I started law enforcement, there was very few females that were arrested. However, now that has changed tremendously and they stay in the jail often. Uh, I have room for 29 female inmates. Uh, I have tried to increase that and I will continue to try, try to increase that capacity to take a uh, burden off of my detention staff. Again, working with our county manager and, and our county commissioners. Thank you. Mr. Root, the same question for you. What challenges facing law enforcement will you address as sheriff as our county continues to grow and change? One of the big things I've spoke about and I've seen, uh, I've, I've stayed on top of the, the uh, law enforcement here in the county, even though I'm not at the sheriff's office anymore, I am still a police officer at City of Ruffton. Uh, we gotta protect our investments. The officers are investments of the taxpayers. Um, I pulled these numbers and they've actually went up. I'm gonna tell you some numbers now of the turnover rate the sheriff's office has had since the current sheriff has been in office. These are numbers I got from the county office. I encourage you to go get them yourself if you'd like to. There've been 121 employees replaced. That's either left, that's full-time, part-time, now don't, don't Hear me out, that's full-time, part-time, civilian and everything. That's employees under the sheriff, okay? I'll break that down for you. Right now, the county has six men per shift, 566 square miles like the sheriff said. The town of Forest City has eight square miles. There is five men per shift. We have six here in the county so at any given time if they're all at work. There's an opening there, unless the sheriff and them have filled it, they have recently had one lost, and by my numbers that I've kept up with, it'll be the 45th different, different road men. Now that's either moved around or hired. Uh, I was also able to get a sheet and it said terminations and it showed. Anybody wants to see me afterwards, I have it. Come straight from the uh, office. There's 39 enforcement officers, 36 enforcement officers. Of, the, of those 121, 
Uh, by the number they give me, 89 was temporary employee. That's part time and full time. 58, that's broke down to 58 from the jail, 18 from the sheriff's office, and 23 from uh, the 911 center. You ask, why are they leaving? I can't answer that. I know money is always going to be an issue. But we have to protect that. Guys, it's kind of like, it's kind of like, you know, if you got an old piece of equipment, do you throw it away or do you invest money in it? Make it continue to work, you know, by, by providing the best environment we can. You know, prime example, your jail. Sheriff spoke about the jail. Six different jail lieutenants in a little over seven and a half years. Six different jail sergeants. The narcotics unit is a four-man unit. I put everything I had in that unit. Put my family second of this county for narcotics. There have been 12 different men in those four positions. The interdiction team, four-man unit, 11 different people have filled those positions. We can go on and on and on. I have it broke down. Now, I'm not smashing the sheriff. Don't, don't take me wrong. I'm telling you, every time you hire an officer, a uniformed officer, it's at least $2,000. Unless he's a big man, it's going to cost you more because my clothes cost more than somebody smaller. <laughs> and you can't, well, what about handing off uniforms? They just switched uniforms in June. Uh, another thing, I want to build the reserves. There are no reserves. The sheriff's fighting an uphill battle because people don't want to do this job. It's a thankless job. Um, I, I threw a lot at you. Feel free. I'll tell you where to get these numbers, and you can look at my papers tonight afterwards. Thank you all so much. Mr. Newton, I'll ask you the, the next question. What is your plan for addressing what some have called the drug epidemic in Rutherford County? Well, just so happens this is my field of interest and my field of love that I spent so much of my career in. First thing we're going to do is we're going to do a restructure of the sheriff's office day one. I'm not going to go in and run around, run off people. As you can tell, we've had enough leave. We're going to look at, look, we're going to be, let's say we're going to be gritty. We're going to think about Rutherford County first. What do we need? We need more people on the road. Day one, with a simple restructure, I'm going to be able to put one more man per shift. I'm going to be able to put two more narcotics officers. One of those narcotics officers is going to be assigned strictly to working with doctors and pharmacies on overprescribing and on the opioid problem. The extra men that's put on the road, we're going to try it first of all, we're putting a fifth section down the middle. I'm going to call it the city section or C5, whichever the, uh, I have for my, my road, road lieutenant. Uh, We'll let him, I'm going to give power back to some of the administrators. The middle management is the backbone of your department. You know, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a lot of weight in asking my men to help me on that and making more decisions. Uh, I have looked at what, we've lost a lot of officers, a lot of officers, uh, experienced officers. If you look at some of the ones, I think have been 12 retired, if you look, every time you lose a 30-year man, you don't get that back overnight. It's hard to go out and recruit those people. I've already shown the man I've asked to be my chief deputy is a retired man that retired in June or July, 30, 30 years. There's other folks that we, we are not in a position to uh, announce their names. I have other 30 and 40 year people who's going to come on in some capacity. We're going to put experience back at the sheriff's office to start moving forward at a rapid rate from day one. Uh, there's other issues we got to deal with. We got to, I hear it all the time. I don't see officers in my community. Well, I'm going to lead by example, guys. I'm I'll tell you this, and I've said it many times. If you want a sheriff that's going to sit in the office and wear a necktie every day, I'm not your man. If you want a sheriff that's going to be out in the community and lead by example, out front, I'm, I'm not scared to answer a call. You know, it don't matter what the title is. I've been doing this a long time. I signed up to be a police officer. I'm a 20-year fireman. I coach youth football. Every bit of that is about the community. You know, I'm going to be out there. If I'm talking to you at your house and we get a call, I'll go take that report if the men are tied up. You know, it's a good thing for the county also. I don't sleep good because my mind never stops. So if I can't sleep, get more, get more out of me because I'm going to get out and about. My wife asked me, she said, I guess this is going to be like when you work drugs. You were gone two and three days at a time. If need be, I will. You know, like I said, if there's anything in my career I'm ashamed of, I put my family second to this county and these citizens. I would do it again because my child, your children, and our families have to be out here. Thank you all so much. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Mr. Francis, same question for you. What is your plan for addressing what some have called the drug epidemic in Rutherford County? There is a drug epidemic. And it's not only in Rutherford County, it's all over the state of North Carolina, all over the United States. Well, what I have done, I have increased from one canine to four canines at the sheriff's office. We have one working each crew. And we have one on our addiction team. We have another that works um, separate, uh, a separate crew. 
and those have been extremely beneficial in uh, finding a lot of narcotics in, in Rutherford County. Another thing that I've done, there was a criminal interdiction team that um, existed prior to me coming to the Sheriff's Office. They spent, I would say, roughly 90% of the time um, on Highway 74 and some on Highway 221. What I have done is I've taken that four-man unit and I have uh, immersed them uh, by changing supervisors and having one supervisor over both of them, uh, both of the groups, meaning the uh, narcotics and the uh, criminal interdiction, to where they communicate better and they work together. They go on search warrants together, they share information together, and I take them off the, the, the highway at a, a possibility of getting dope that's coming through the can. We still get information, get tips to, to get that, those drugs from time to time, but I put them in communities. We have uh, drug complaints, and that was one way that, that I have seen a, a difference in, in the communities by putting those, uh, those officers in that area. Also, you have to adapt. When I came into law enforcement over 22 years ago, crack cocaine was one of our biggest problems. I saw that uh, transition into to methamphetamine in clan labs in Rutherford County and, and throughout. Through law change and different enforcement methods, uh, clan labs are, are not nearly the problem they are. Meth still is, but not clan labs. Now we get meth that comes from, uh, usually from Mexico, and it comes from uh, Georgia, Atlanta, it comes a lot of times from Greenville and Spartanburg but you have to adapt, you have to understand. Now, uh, we're having to deal a lot more with fentanyl and a lot more with heroin. As those drugs come in, we have to understand uh, how serious they are, how they can uh, interfere with um, our public as well as our officers. We have to make sure uh, that we protect both of our citizens and our deputy sheriffs. We've uh, got Narcan with our deputy sheriffs now so they can protect themselves, as well as our canines in case those canines get sniffed. But my point is, you have to adapt. You cannot get complacent, and you have to be, uh, be uh, available to learn as uh, these different types of drugs are used and changed and the methods to get here. You have to stay up to date, and that's what uh, my officers have done. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Gentlemen, we did have one question passed to me through uh, Mr. Cool, so I have one more question for you both. Mr. Francis, we're gonna start with you. What is your law enforcement experience, and how much experience do you have in narcotics? You have three minutes. When I started off, uh, actually it's been closer to 23 years ago, I went undercover while I was um, at, Malin, at a deputy sheriff of Avery County at Malin Community College. I had the opportunity uh, to actually uh, buy marijuana, and we made the several LSD uh, arrests there as well. Also at Hickory, I had the opportunity to go undercover and buy crack cocaine. Uh, although uh, those are, are limited in my 20, 23 years almost now of experience, I have had a lot of firsthand experience uh, dealing with our drug dealers as well as our drug users. Being a, uh, a road officer, being a, a first line supervisor, and being a, an investigator, what I have found is that it's the same, the same criminals that are using those drugs that are committing those crimes that are making your B&Es and your larcenies. We've been able to reduce uh, crime in Rutherford County uh, if you look at the uniform crime rate, uh, prior to me being sheriff, it was over 3,000 uh, numerous years. We've had it under 2,000 uh, and, and consistently right, right up around 22 to 2,300, uh, which is a huge improvement. Again, you cannot become complacent. I've, it's my goal to continue that uh, with 23 years of experience and uh, sharing that experience. And again, I also uh, lead by example. Uh, I answer calls, I back up deputy sheriffs on calls, I back up police officers on calls. Um, I have uh, trained each of my deputy sheriffs to do the same, and I think that's why I get compliments all the time from people saying, have you improved or the, increased the number of deputy sheriffs? And, and I haven't increased, but only two in eight years. But again, people see more deputy sheriffs, and they, they, they're led to believe that just because uh, the mindset has changed at the sheriff's office. Sir. Mr. Hoot, the same question, what is your law enforcement experience and how much experience do you have in narcotics? Well, as, as you've heard, most of my career has been in narcotics. Uh, I, when I came in, we led the state three years in meth labs. Uh, that's how I learned how to work federal cases. We worked several large-scale federal cases on clandestine labs, and we sent off the meth cooks in this county. And that, with the change of the Sudafed law, we went from first, which you want, you want to be number one in some things, but you don't want to be number one in that. So uh, we had a very aggressive unit at the time. Uh, we had a great lieutenant that worked with us, and he, he 
helped me learn how to work federal cases. Uh, so we took that on a little farther and we started working with other agencies. That's, that's another big thing. We got to work outside this county lines. We will work with Hendersonville and other agencies and work large scale meth conspiracy cases. You know, that's where you get your bang for your buck. You know, you send off these guys, they get indicted federally, they're gone. You know, some of those guys that we indicted in 06 and 07 are still doing federal prison time on the clandestine labs. Uh, more of my experience, I've typed well over 300 search warrants myself, most, most of which, almost all of them have been narcotics. Well over, well over 1,000 cases, either initiated or assisted. Uh, if I must make a bold statement, I am the most, I have more training than anyone in this county in narcotics, but I've done it longer than anyone. Uh, I understand, I keep up with all the trends and traits. I have clandestine lab training coming up in two weeks where I'll get recertified again. If we have labs, I can be one of the ones who can take those down. Um, and like the sheriff said, trends have changed. Uh, the drugs in this county have, have went, you know, we still got meth, like the sheriff said, heroin. But when taking this experience forward, you know, we've got to get these guys more acclimated to, and to attack these a little more aggressive than is being attacked right now. You know, there's a great group of guys I'll never take away from me in the minute in the sheriff's office. We've got to get on these drugs a little harder than they're got on right now. I st I'm still in court. I'll go to court uh, this week. And I see, you know, the, the charges ain't like they were when we were there. We had a more aggressive unit when we were there. Um, more aggressive standpoint because these people are the ones that are committing your other crimes. It's like dealing with a poisonous snake. You cut his head off, problem solved. That's what we got to get after with these drugs. You know, it's, it's as simple as that. I know it sounds crude. I'm not a fancy speaker. I'm a policeman that cares about this county. And I know the drug problem in this county. And uh, we're going to hopefully have an opportunity to attack it. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Gentlemen, we're going to give each of you two minutes for closing remarks, and we'd like for you to come up to the podium for that. Mr. Uden, you have the podium. Once again, I thank everyone for coming out. As you can tell, I'm not a polished speaker, uh, which I think that's fine. I'm a policeman. I want to tell everyone, and uh, I'm running unaffiliated. I didn't change my, my party group. I'm still a registered Republican. The reason I chose to run unaffiliated, I'm not a politician. If I win, I own only you, the citizens. There's no push, no pull from anyone. I'm not that guy. You know, I am a community servant. I understand that the first thing to being a good leader, you have to be a servant. I have, I have put everything that I've known to do in the last 14 months into learning everything I can from the citizens in this county. I've been to every corner of this county. There's endless miles, endless amounts of gas. 30 pounds of weight gained from going to every chicken pie in this uh, dinner in this county. <laughs> I've enjoyed every bit of it. You know, like I said earlier, I am an investment of yours. The reason I have that training, the reason I can, I, can, I can put a feather in my hat and talk about all that I've done is because of you, the citizens. I'm in the city of Rolston. They're benefiting from all that the county invested in me for years. That's good for them. I need to be used on a bigger scale. I need to serve everyone in the county, not just the citizens of Rolston. We have a great town. I'm very blessed. You know, if, if I ask you to keep me in mind for a more down to earth approach at the sheriff's position, if not, I'll be in the city of Rolton. If you decide you want to move and want me to be your, your protector or your, your enforcement man, come to the city. We'll be glad to have you. But I'm asking, bigger scale, let me be your sheriff. That's been my slogan on my sign. If you hear it, let me be your sheriff. A sheriff for everyone. That's what we have a chance to do this time. A sheriff for everyone. Poor, rich, it don't matter. Because no, no groups, no, no politics is push or pull. I'm not that guy. Thank y'all so much. Mr. Francis, you have two minutes. I also would like to thank you, each of you, for coming out tonight, learning more about each of your candidates, not only the sheriff, but your other candidates. And I encourage you to come out Thursday night as well. The reason why I'm running for sheriff of Rutherford County for re-election is because I care about this county. It's the reason why I sacrifice every day. It's the reason why I've sacrificed for the last 23 years, because I care about the citizens. This is where I want to raise my family. Even though I started my career in Hickory, 
I wanted to get in a, a bigger environment, a larger city, and learn uh, more, uh, more as much as I can actually uh, about how to fight crime in a, in a larger scale area. I learned a good bit there. I learned a good bit while I worked at the Forest City Police Department and Lake Lure, but I have learned the most at the Rutherford County Sheriff's Office. In the last eight years as your sheriff, that is where I have learned to be the sheriff, that firsthand experience. I have had to release people. That's a hard job. I'm not a political person either. I put my big boy boots on and I take care of business. And if somebody's not taking care of the citizens of this county or representing the sheriff of this county the way that they need to be, not treating somebody with the respect that they should, then they're no longer going to represent the sheriff. Now, the numbers sound uh, huge, but, but when you start talking about part-time, I've helped a lot of people get jobs by giving that first part-time uh, job in the jail. They come to me with a college degree and no state or federal agency will hire them. I talked to a federal probation officer today from Rutherford County who got his first job opportunity as a part-time uh, deputy sheriff or part-time detention officer at Rutherford County Jail. He did that because I gave him a shot. Now he's living his dreams and he's still taking care of people in the county. We work with the U.S. Marshals and that federal probation officer today to take a drug dealer out of Rutherford County and got drug tax money to sue. It's going to help pay for equipment. And I've not mentioned how many hundreds of thousands of dollars that I've saved each of you by using that truck drug tax money uh, to, to better equip the deputy sheriff of Rutherford County. So there, there are some, some tough jobs as a sheriff. I have 130 employees, 78 are sworn deputy sheriffs. Uh, not everybody wants to be in law enforcement anymore. It's not easy. Even less want to be uh, telecommunication detention staff. So I'm looking for good ones. Thank you. Big hand for both our sheriff candidates. And how about another hand for all our candidates tonight? Thank you everyone for being here. Uh, on behalf of the Rutherford County Chamber of Commerce and Leadership Rutherford, we thank you for your attendance and your interest in this process. Uh, everyone from Isothermal thanks you for being here at your community college. Don't forget, we'll be back here Thursday night, October the 18th, 6 p.m. Uh, with Board of Education candidates, Clerk of Superior Court, and North Carolina State Senate District 47. Hope you'll come back and be with us on Thursday night. Have a great evening. <laughs>